Today's topic is the fear of God. This is the third session in our series on the path to salvation. So why fear of God, you say? Isn't God love? Well, let's see what unfolds in why we have uh, this particular session titled in this way. The Lord said, Watch, therefore, for you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. So why would he tell us to watch? What are we to watch for and why why do we watch? Is it that maybe there's going to be this time when we're going to be asked to account for our life here on earth and have we truly followed his commandments? Have we followed him and become one with him so we can be united with him in his kingdom? This I only makes sense, this question, if we have true faith. So why would that be? What is true faith? This is, true faith is we've got faith with unwavering loyalty because we have experienced God. And once we experience God, we want to make sure that we are ready for him whenever he comes for us. So this true faith comes after we've experienced the awakening, as we talked in the previous previous session. This awakening grace, when divine grace comes to us and we experience God uh, through this uncreated energies of, of God himself. So, this awakening is what we call that active divine grace, where when it comes, our sinfulness is exposed fully to us. We see what kind of condition we really, our soul really is in. And we sense the danger of the situation that we find ourselves in. And therefore we begin to fear for ourselves and to care about our deliverance from our misfortune and salvation. So we're being awakened to this fallen condition where we find ourselves separated from God, where our body and our brain now is controlling our soul, and our soul has needs to be liberated from its covering of sin. So it's with this awakening that we come to know God's love and also the great mercy he has. So we're coming with knowing God loves us. He wants us to become better than we are. He wants us to be united with him fully. And he's going to do everything he can to help us along this path. There's two things that are necessary for our spiritual growth, to grow, to become one with him. The first is knowing this, that we're separated from God, that we have this awakening grace that has awakened us to our condition, our true condition. And we need to know what our aim is. It's not just being happy in this life, it's about being united with God, to be one with Him, so we can join with Him in paradise, in eternal life. So, part of this fear comes from this potential loss of the promised eternal life in paradise which is going to only come from God's grace. So what does this fear do to us? What does it create in us? It creates this motivation, right? Right? We don't want to lose this place with God that he promised us. So in reality, how often... How often do we think about what happens when that time comes, when our life is, this life is taken from us? Do we really think about, are we prepared for eternal life with Christ? So during our naval day, what happens? What, what takes place? Don't we tend to ignore God and keep on with the life that we've led so far? We think we are in charge and everything comes from us. We forget to thank God or even ask God for help. Our minds hold on to all its old habits. So we continue in the patterns that we've had in the past. And the body's demanding its priority. And all its passions, they easily overtake our, our actions. And why? Because we are fallen, right? 
We haven't yet uncovered the nature of our sinfulness. We're separated from God. We need to find that unity and feel the presence of God in our daily activity, and then we'll be walking with Him as one, as His children. So, it is with humility that we're able to see Him. And if we do not have the full will and ability to live the Orthodox life without this humility, without this understanding, this experience of God, this true faith is what's required. Because we remain attached to the things of this earthly life. They're the things that are real to us, not God, not what He's bringing us towards. So this fear, if we can tap into it, helps us to accept this limited condition that we are, humble us, and then motivates us, motivate us to uh, face a lengthy process that's commonly called purification of the heart. So we're going to learn humility, we're going to learn obedience, and we're going to learn love of God. So what can we do? St. Theophon has a suggestion for us. It's definitely one important way. He says, St. Isaac Syrian says, we need to strive to enter the temple that's within ourselves. God is within us once we've been baptized. And you'll see this heavenly temple within us that we can draw upon. So what is the nature of the spiritual world that we call it to, that he, uh, St. Theophon talks about? He says we need to intensify our inner vision about the nature of the spiritual world to maintain this zeal to overcome our passions. What is the nature of this world? What is he talking about? Well, he says, his words, God is one. He's worshipped in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's the creator. He's the upholder of all things. Whereas the apostle says, he's the head of all things. So he adds, our Lord Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, this is something that's constantly active in our life within the church, within Christ, active in the Holy Church, having perfected the faithful, he transports them into another world. So it's the Spirit that's going to perfect us through the sacramental life in the church. This is part of this vision we need to have of the whole world, the nature of this sacramental life, what we experience when we come to the divine liturgy and participate in Holy Communion, or when we go to the priest and participate in the sacrament of Holy Confession. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's part of this vision of the Holy World that we are, not only do we have God within us, but God is working through us, through His divine grace or the Holy Spirit continually. So as he works through us, we can be taken to another world where we can complain, uh, obtain and claim our, our inheritance to his kingdom. It's waiting there for us to claim. But we have to be open to the work of the Spirit. St. John affirms this role of the Holy Spirit. He says the Holy Spirit was to have no other role on earth than to make Christ present, to take what is Christ and declare it to us, and then reveal him to us and thereby guide us in all truth. So Theophon goes on with his words, but first we're going to, I could quote here from Emilia Nos, the elder of Simeon Petra, a recent, a recent memory. He says, God is beyond the heavens. He is not part of this created material order, neither is he part of the created spiritual order. He's something beyond. 
God sits on a throne. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, like a king. He transcends all things. All things we know of heavenly, all things we know of the earthly. He's above all. Although he's in all as well, through his divine grace. And he's surrounded by angels. These angels are constantly glorifying him. And we know this from Scripture too. But the seat, his throne is also a seat of judgment. We're all going to face this time and look upon this throne with the judge sitting there. Daniel says, before the throne, the court sat in judgment and the books are opened. So what's going to be in there in your entry under your name? In our own church, you can see behind our throne, or I mean, excuse me, behind the altar is a throne. You can barely see it in this picture here. But so it's the bishop's throne that's behind the altar representing Christ there on the throne. Everything that's in the church, of course, is always pointing towards, towards God. And St. Theophon continues with his vision of the spiritual world. He says, this world will continue until the fullness of time, or the end of time, when at the resurrection and the judgment, all will receive according to their deeds. Some will descend into hell, while others will dwell in paradise. So we have in this vision the almighty reigning power of God. We have this paradigm of salvation, of being lifted up into eternal life. And we have the four finalities that face us, death, judgment, paradise, as well as hell. So he says, see yourself as being upheld by the right hand of God and as seen by God's eyes, saved in the Lord, standing after death before the judgment, which will determine whether you will be received into paradise or swallowed up by hell. Visualize yourself at this point. He says, stand in this world, feeling you are there, feeling upheld in the almighty power of God as a child, presented before a king. St. Porphyrius adds a comment. He says, if we do not become one with the earthly church here and now, we are in danger of losing the heavenly church too. Because the church is paradise here on earth, exactly the same as paradise in heaven. So our main concern must be to devote ourselves to Christ, to unite ourselves to the church. As we unite to the church, the church is no, nothing but Christ here on earth. We all are members of him and he is part of us. We are one. We are united. So, also remember that the church and the liturgy are all made in the image of paradise. That's why it's a special place that's set aside only for our worship. And when we have liturgy, every, the whole church, the earthly church, the heavenly church, come together, the angels, the saints, and we as a people of this earth still living on the earth, they all come together as one. So this church is the, as it's said in Acts, is the assembly, so that the multitude of believers are of one heart and of one soul, so that all become the body of Christ as their head and members of each other, as Paul tells us. This unity in all embracing of life is when God dwells with mankind, and it is the whole of paradise, whole of paradise. So our challenge is to make this spiritual vision something that we are aware of continually from the time we awake in the morning. Have a 
thy kind of cross or, or the last judgment, put where you will see it often, to keep this in your memory, to remind you. And remember that God's unexpected judgments and and there'll be fatal accidents that come with this. We don't know when that time is. We don't know when he will come, when we're going to face this judgment cease. So visualize your own death and your own funeral. Not in a morbid way, but in a way of what could be joyful that you get to join with Christ and be united with him forever in his paradise. But you have to be prepared. You have to know you want this and know that you're working hard to be qualified to be accepted in his kingdom. So, with the pain and fear of God, fall down before God with the words, Lord, who know east of all things, save me, and I will labor according to my strength. And with this vision ever present, we must continually strive to uncover our sinfulness. So, our present condition is kind of like this, right? As we've talked several times now, that we're separated from God. The body is taken over. Our mind is controlling our soul. We think we're in charge. Our self-centeredness is strong. Our self-will is strong. We haven't truly linked our self-will with God's will. And we're, this is a fallen condition that we find ourselves in. But we know that God's image is in us. And we have a, he has a plan for us, as we've seen from the Sermon on the Mount, the things we have to fulfill. And as we look at this teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, we find there's a gap that exists between our present condition and this idea of this ideal where we are united with God and he is working through our soul and our soul is working with our body and we become truly his children and his instruments in this world. And this gap is to our benefit to make it as wide as possible because the more we know about our sinfulness, the more we're going to be motivated to do the things that are necessary for us to become united with God. So we can think of it this way, that as our, we grow spiritually, we start with a gap, and this gap grows, and this gap gets bigger as we become closer and closer to God, as we grow spiritually. It's just going to continue to grow bigger. That's why the saints always say that they're the greatest sinners of all, because they see all elements of their sinfulness that are basically are hidden from us, that we are blind. So in this gap, we see our sinfulness. And we can also get a positive result of this emerging consciousness of our spiritual condition. It's what's leading us forward, closer to God. And you don't want to view this in some legalistic way. No, no, no. This is a, a we got to remember that God is also love and has great mercy. He's not trying to punish us, find a fault and punish us. No, he wants us to find the fault so we can grow Become like he has intended us to become. So don't feel guilty about being in this condition, but be concerned and be motivated to go about and change your life, become more Christ-like. And then seek the grace of God. Seek the Holy Spirit. Ask for his mercy. Ask for forgiveness. Be humble. And let the church be your guide. Church, the Christ on earth. He is the body of Christ that we have. Let him be your guide and to help us. Everything you need is within the bounds of the church. It's a spiritual hospital there to help you come to your salvation. So, let's face it. There is important work that we need, need to do. But when you think of fear, what is it you fear most? What is the biggest fear you have? It could be a loss of friendship, maybe a loss of a job, or maybe getting sick, having to suffer something painful, maybe just being embarrassed or slighted in some way. We all have different fears. And probably for most of us, if we really think about it, 
The loss of this life is something really fearful. But as you come closer to God, you'll begin to fear something different. You will know God, so you won't have fear of loss of life, but you maybe have fear that you will not be yet know God well enough to be accepted in his kingdom. So we begin to fear for the condition of our soul. This gap that we have becomes larger and that we will be accepted, that we want to be accepted, and we fear that this may not be true. So we develop this reverent respect for God as the creator and as the infinite power. So we can see this as the development of this fear of God. Not to be afraid of him, but knowing that we have work to do ourselves. So holding on to this spiritual realm, this vision of St. Theophon, he instructs us to go within. And this realm must be open to us because God is within. It's all within us. We just have to open up to it. It's all there for us. Learn the remembrance of God, remembrance of death, the remembrance of sin, self-reproach. This is the most direct path to salvific disposition, tells us. But, as you say, God is love, right? Why fear him? Well, in reality, it is not God we fear, but our lack of relationship with him, that we may not know him. This is what we should fear. That we'll lose, if we have it, that we'll lose this relationship. So our fear is truly, should be, our missing out in our salvation. This is what we should truly fear. And so we'll have this fear of God only before we come to know him. And then once we know him, we feel united with him, we know we're walking with him day by day, hour by hour, then our love and his love will be our motivation to maintain that love. So why is this fear of God positive? It's not being afraid of God, but that we fear we may not be worthy to be joined with him in eternal life, in his kingdom. Let's talk a little bit about death and the final judgment. So I suggest here that you might want to pause and write down three words about how you feel about death. What is your current view on death? Death it's the separation of the soul from the body. As Paul says, it is the deliverance of the soul from prison. It's a departure, he said. Peter says it's putting off the body. And in Acts, Luke refers to it as sleep. Also, we know that Paul tells us that with death comes judgment. He says it, it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. And this is what is called in the Orthodox Church a particular judgment. This is when our relationship with God really matters at this point in death that we die. You remember that story of the Lazarus and the rich man? Here it is. It comes from Luke. It's a parable about death and judgment. He says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man then also died and was buried. And being in a torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, and he saw Abraham afar off with Lazarus in his bosom. He then cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his fingers in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. 
But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Words to ponder here. Why did he tell us this story? What is the significance to this, of this story? Think about it. Reflect on it. Meditate on it. He goes on to say, I beg you, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, No, Father Abraham. But if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. So if we can't see the resurrection of Christ as being the reason for all this, Who would we pay attention to, he's saying, right? He's bringing us to listen to the story. Believe it. Seek God. Seek his energy so you can be united like Lazarus in eternal life. So reflect on this, what the implications are. It's an important parable. There are some important implications. Most fathers interpret it that at death we are judged, and the fact that it is final. If we don't know him at the time of death, how are we going to become part of his kingdom? We have to know him right now. Otherwise, how are we going to know him later? If we have a personal relationship with God, we'll know his mercy. We'll be seeking his mercy. We'll be seeking his help. We'll be wanting to be united with him because of his love. So our relationship with God needs to be well established in this love before we die. What does this relationship mean, imply? What does it mean? We have the parable of talents, too. Another important parable. It says, Shortly before this crucifixion, Jesus told the disciples this parable not to emphasize that he expects us to be good stewards of the grace he has given us. This is setting the standard for us, what we're expected. He said, The one who had buried his talents was cast into the outer dark darkness. So we can't just accept these talents as our own. But they're being given to us to God to multiply them, to carry out His work, not to just make our life good and happy for ourselves. So Jesus go on to say in this same discussion that on this day of judgment, He's going to separate us one from the other as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left hand. The question is, are we like sheep that follow? Are we like rebellious goats that seem to go by their own will? He says, then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, unto everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And these will go away into everlasting punishment. So at the universal resurrection, at the second coming of our Lord, there will be accomplished this resurrection of the dead. All will be resurrected. Some will go 
to heaven, some will go to hell, some will be totally, eternally separated from God, which is hell. It will be universal and simultaneous, solemn and open, strict and terrible, final and definitive, determining for all eternity our faith. So what will our new bodies be like after this resurrection? Assuming we're going to be the ones pulled up into paradise, right? Or what will they even be like separated from God? Well, we can learn clues from the transfiguration of Christ and his presence that came about after his resurrection. We can see that he's essentially the same in appearance, but he's different. He's been transfigured. The bodies of the righteous will be incorrupted and immortal, free from infirmities, weaknesses, and will not have any bodily needs. And this new life will be like the life of angels. We'll become like angels, like them. So, the question is, is the world eternal? And the thing to remember is we cannot place our hope in this world because Scripture tells us that it is not. It is not eternal. As Peter writes, he says, The heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away, and with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and all the works that are in it will be burned up. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. All will be transformed. The primary feeling should always be this fear of God because of this judgment that's going to come and our wondering how close we are to God. Do we know him? And the conclusion, one that's one, that one should be selfless and to dedicate ourselves to God's will. And that God is the one that is true goodness. And that is the one that saves us with our unity with him. We will be saved. We will but find a way into his kingdom. And this primary feeling is born out this vision of the spiritual world that Theophon, St. Theophon outlined to us. He says, Theophon again, with pain and fear of God, fall down, before God with these words, Lord, who knowest all things, save me, and I will labor according to my strength. He says, this is everything. Let me give you one last thought to ponder here. We already have a lot, I know, but just think of this one last thought here. I'll leave this for you to consider. At the hour of death, when our whole structure undergoes a violent breakup, when the brain loses its lucidity and the heart experiences either fierce pain or enfeeblement, then all our theoretical knowledge disappears. It goes by the board. Our tremendous Sophronia, St. Sophronia. So with that, ponder on this idea of the fear of God and see if it can't be, as you develop this spiritual vision of the world, something that can be a motivation for you that will help you maintain the zeal that's necessary to purify your heart so that you truly will do the things necessary to uncover the sinfulness, to cleanse your heart from it, so you're open to this will of God, to his voice, to his divine grace, that will be with you at all times, during the day, during the night, at all times. And that you will run to the church with joy to participate in the sacramental life where this is nurtured in you, the spiritual life.
darkness. Your awareness of the sinfulness will grow and grow and grow. And you'll become pure and pure and closer and closer to God. So at that point, eventually there'll be little question about it. the prodigal son returned, God was there with open arms to throw a party at our return. 